Good afternoon, Ryan. Thank you for joining us on another Facebook Friday. How are you, sir? Doing good. How are you? Doing well. Just uh, living the dream, right? Yeah. Looks like we are getting our stay-at-home orders extended, and I'm sure everybody in the world is excited for that. Um, so I just thought it would be a good thing for us to cover today on you know, the lessons that we learned from the first period that we went through and, you know, things that we can, you know, do going forward, you know, you know, what, how can we apply what we learned the first time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first one took us all by surprise. And so now we've, we've learned some hard lessons for some of us and some of us have learned, uh, you know, what it's like to be locked down for a while or maybe not have employment for a little bit. Um, yeah. So that little bit of relief, uh, when they, they say, yeah, you can go back out, you can go dine in as long as you put a mask on. Yeah. Gave us a little bit of freedom. And um, it's funny to see how quickly a lot of us go back to our normal ways, our normal habits. Yeah. But knowing that this lockdown thing is more than likely going to get pretty restrictive here again, as, especially as we head into the winter months and things like that, then um, there are a lot of things that we need to make sure we don't lose out of our short-term memory and that we can actually do some a better job preparing for this go around. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, the governor is supposed to be doing a press release here pretty quick to address whether or not uh, the state is going to allow schools to be back on campus. So that'll be, you know, that'll have huge impacts on most everybody's life <laughs> moving forward. So, so maybe let's start with that. Um, you know, a lot of things that we're seeing that coming into demand in the market are, you know, like the bonus rooms or the dens or lofts, you know, things like that um, for people to use for a, a home office or for a home gym, right? Or like a third car garage has become a pretty big deal, you know, for people to use as the gym. Um, and I'm sure what's going to be really popular if, you know, we're distance learning for the schools is going to be some kind of school room. You know, like I have a lot of friends that, you know, homeschooled their kids already and they had a dedicated room in their house for that. Pretty sure that's about to become a lot more popular. <laughs> you know, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, we, we've seen it. Uh, so just buyers that are coming to us for pre-approval and then we ask them a little bit about what their wish list looks like and in a perfect world, what kind of house would you have? And um, more often than not, they're, they want that extra space. They maybe want to they were okay in a three bedroom, they want a fourth bedroom. And they wanted, uh, used to be that people would say, we want the fourth bedroom for an office or a, a bonus room or a guest room. Uh, they're, they're changing the way that they're asking for that now. They're saying, we want the fourth bedroom now because I have to work at home or my kids need a place to study. So right to your point, yeah. um, it's difficult to, you know, if, if you had worked at home ever in your life and you have to work at home in your living room, where you normally sit and watch TV or play games with your family, it's difficult to kind of get into work mode. So to have a dedicated space for that is really important, not just for you as uh, somebody who may be working, but also for your kids. Can't expect them to sit at the dining room table where they normally eat dinner and crank out all their work and do it just like they're at school. Yeah. Take them a minute to kind of adapt. So if you had a dedicated space, um, if it were large enough that you could, you know, uh, partition a couple of kids areas, you know, so they can kind of do their thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's super important. And we're seeing that with, uh, with people either wanting to remodel their existing home and make a retrofit so that it can kind of accommodate this sort of lifestyle. Um, and then again, with the people that are out there looking to buy, it's kind of high on their list. They're saying, look, we want that extra space. It used to be maybe as a kid's room. Now it's a, it's a study area uh, yeah. or a multi-purpose room. For sure. And I like I'm a creature of habit for sure. And my environment has a huge impact on, you know, how productive I am. And so before, like I couldn't work from home, like I, it was terrible. Like it was in case of emergencies only, right. you know, and just, you know, get something done real quick. Um, you know, and say, so like at the office, like it's set up here, like it's my comfort zone, if you will, you know, like everything is in place and so it's not distracting, I guess, is the point. And it has to be that way with the kids. Like I, I know with my kids, it is, you know, that's what made me think of it was trying to have the kids do homework at the dining room table. That's not the environment that they're used to doing that in. And it's hard to adjust, like you said. 
like right. that's so hard. So yeah, we're, we are seeing a big demand for the extra space, like you were saying. Um, I'm thinking that maybe the ADUs are going to be, you know, the accessory dwelling units are going to, I have to imagine, get real popular real quick now just for this. Um, have you done much with those? Do you have much experience with those? I haven't. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with them, obviously. Um, I haven't done a lot in terms of financing an ADU for somebody. Most of the time when that situation comes up, somebody's pulling a little bit of cash out of their house mm -hmm. and they're self-financing that ADU. Yeah. Uh, but I do know that in talking to the people that have done that, um, those extra spaces are a lot easier to get permits for and, and basically allow them to sit on your property now because we've adjusted as a county, the lot lines are a lot different. Yeah. Uh, it used to be that your setbacks were pretty far away. And so some of these properties could not accommodate an ADU, um, mm -hmm. but they've been a lot more generous with where you can place these now. So I think that could be something that we see down the road. And again, in a situation where you can't, maybe you can't sell your house today, uh, just yeah. doesn't work out that way. You don't have the space and ADU could be a, a potential solution for that. Um, and, and maybe down the road, if, you know, if everything goes back to normal, instead of just using that for, you know, a, a home office and you decide you're going to go to the office some more, you know, that, that could be for a family member to, to accommodate, you know, so yeah. ADUs are, there's a lot of potential there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to your point about the family, you know, member for the future or whatever, like I remember probably 2005, six ish, um, I remember just this huge surge of people wanting the downstairs bedrooms, you know, in a downstairs bedroom bathroom for a mother-in-law or somebody to come in and stay. Um, I thought it was real interesting. It hit all at the same time, um, which I thought was interesting, but I'm sure that the ADU idea is going to take off and the county is pushing it. Um, I know that when they first announced it, that they were doing some programs, like they were going to give you grant money to put them in the backyard. It was like 70 or $80,000 they were gonna give you. And they would give it to you as long as you rented it to low income housing or something like that. I, I don't remember because it's been a while since I saw it and I think they ran out of the money. Um, but they were pushing it and they were they were doing it in um, like on small lots. Like they were doing it, at, like someone was on like a 7,500 foot lot and they were like, yeah, go ahead and throw this 800 square foot building on the back and we'll give you X amount of money as long as, you know, you agree to rent it out. So I think that that'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, obviously, people wouldn't be renting. Oh, maybe they wouldn't be renting it out. Maybe they will. You know, maybe that's a play for people who lose their employment. Yeah, your income gets cut a little bit, hours, you're furloughed, you, you lose, you know, one of the household incomes that you normally are, are receiving. Yeah. Um, right now, you know, maybe that unemployment, that little bit of boost that you get through the unemployment kind of helps, but it, it's going to eventually expire. And, um, and yeah, having an additional place where you can kind of generate income, that might be a good option for people. Um, going back to your 2005, 2006, uh, you know, seeing that all of a sudden there was this big surge for that. And I remember that um, people were looking for homes that had you know, more than one unit on the, on the property. Part of the reason for that is because the house prices were driven up. Yeah. And so to afford to live in the one home, they were putting a couple of families together or they were, the, the intent was to rent one of the other units. So there was just this massive like, hey, I'm throwing up my hands. I can't afford rent anymore. I'm going to buy something, but I want to buy something that's going to help offset the cost to own that. So that's what you saw a lot of back then. Um, yeah. Well, and I'm seeing it again right now, I think, you know, probably two or three people this week that I've talked to are looking at doing that. It's, you know, at least, um, you know, a, a family and then maybe like their brother-in-law or sister-in-law moving in with them or, you know, their parents, you know, one of the sets of parents moving in with them right. and like all of them trying to qualify for the loan to purchase. And, you know, so, so they have the income to do so, but then they also need the larger home to accommodate and it's you know kind of a catch-22 I guess but it's a lot easier to do that in today's market than it would be to try to go get two of the smaller entry-level homes right I mean, those things yeah. are just exploding I mean yeah the number of offers that we're getting on the houses below 350 is insane and 
and even if there is anything under 300, it's, we had one that we had like 19 offers on last week. It was so crazy. I mean, how do you even go through that and decide, you know, out of the, several of those are going to almost match. And so how do you decide like who gets it, who doesn't? And then, yeah, that's, that's wild. That's so many people looking. Um, I don't, I don't know if you know offhand or not, but do you remember the stats, you know, lately for this week on, on how many houses are on the market? Um, I will look right now. It was like 350 when I saw it the other day. And that was uh, from Rosemond to um, Acton. So just you so know, nothing north of Rosemond. In perspective, you know, a normal healthy market, how many homes would normally be listed for sales? 1,600. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to say, it's usually it's like 15 to 2,000, somewhere right in that range is normally what we would see. It's kind of a more, a more balanced market. And we got 350? It's We're just 335 right now. 335. Yeah. And that, that includes condos. So that's down even more than it was maybe a week or two ago. I think we were yeah. you know, tapping into the low 400s. Yeah. 314 single family houses. Yeah. And that's all. And that's all price ranges. So and that's last, the problem. We've, we've sold more than we brought in. That's kind been the story. Down. That's been the story most of the year. Like, and, and at a rapid rate, like it was like 20% plus more homes were going into escrow each week than new ones were coming on the market. It was insane. Um, and then so houses with pools, there's only 43 on the market right now. And I think and you that, were at 50 before? Yeah. Last week? Yep. Okay. Well, seven are gone. <laughs> yeah. <for laughs> or, sure. or more are gone and a couple new ones came in. You know, there's this, this you know, kind of normal mix. Yeah. So we have 314 houses on the market. We have 912 in escrow. We have almost three times as many in that's escrow crazy. that we have on the market. It's crazy. So crazy. Okay, so, I mean, so, that's good. The, so the demand is of, high. Speaking of escrow, we, we were locked down for a little while. Right? I mean, this is something probably good to kind of talk about and kind of bring up. Locked down for a little bit. Some people were furloughed or out of complete work. They just got back to work. Yep. Some of those positions are in jeopardy of getting furloughed or uh, laid off or, or temporarily laid off rather um, again. So if, a, lot. If, a lot of them, if you were in a position where you were not working, then you kind of came back and you're planning to buy a house, you need to move pretty quick because if you're in the middle of escrow, even if you got a deposit in and the appraisal's done and your loan's approved and we go to validate employment and you're no longer working because of this shutdown, yeah. you don't have a loan. And it's not going to be anybody's fault other than it's just a bad situation. So you have to get into a position where you can move fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, as we get these little updates and they say, hey, the, you know, the hair salons are closed, nail salons are closed. They start to tell us, you know, what's not working, what's loud. Mm -hmm. uh, we're scrubbing actively our, our in-process loans. We're also scrubbing our pre-approved loans just to make sure is there any interruption for any of those folks? Yeah. Because if there is, we've got to get to them fast. We got to let them know. Hey, you got to maybe put the house hunting on pause for a minute until you can get back. Because remember, when you were out of work, if you're an hourly employee, most banks are going to want you back to work for 30 days mm. to be eligible to, to buy a house. So if you're back for, in some cases, people just got back for 30 days and then now they're laid off again. Yeah. So now they're out of work. So they could have maybe bought in that little window, but if they didn't, are almost on pause again. And, um, and even with that, we still have just buyers out in droves trying to buy these houses that are, you know, essential uh, yeah. working employees. And it's crazy. For sure. I mean, it's, the market is just insane. And to your point about moving quickly and tying that to your question earlier, when we had 19 offers on a house, like how do you choose that was one of the biggest factors was like, Hey, how quickly can they close? Mm -hmm. And, you know, because the sellers when educated understand that there's a small window right now and they're willing to go through the headache of making a double move or, you know, whatever, like sitting in their fifth wheel on, you know, a family or friend's property, whatever they have to do just so they can pull the money out of the property. And that's, that's a black and white change from, you know, six months ago, let alone 12 or 18, you know, people were like, no, like, let's go. Like I need 45 days and maybe we'll put a contingency in there that I can extend it another, you know, 14 or 21. 
so I can find a place and I don't really feel like moving twice, but it, it's changed right now. So, you know, for a buyer, that's one way they can make their offer stronger is, you know, say that they can close quickly and they're willing to do so, but then also let them know like, but if you need more time, you know, we're flexible on that too. Right. So. Yeah. So I think to your point, you, you know, buyers have to be flexible to the seller. They have to, if they can offer a way to accommodate the seller's need, yeah. you know, put themselves ahead of the competition because now it's like, okay, well, if you need a little more time, we'll give you that extra time. If you need to move fast, we'll do that. It's almost like the buyers, you know, just bending left and right, but honestly they have to do that in order to kind of look a little bit better than the other group that's, you know, maybe has some, some contingencies that can't be moved that are, um, limiting to the seller and maybe doesn't make things as easy on the seller side. So. Yeah. Well, and, and buyers that, you know, if they have money in the bank, you know, and they want to buy a home, but already own one, you know, that like, that's a scenario I have going right now is like, okay, we have X amount of money in the bank. That's enough for us to be able to qualify to purchase the next house that we want. And we'll do that and we'll buy that house, not contingent on us selling our current house. Right. And even though they 100% fully intend on selling that house, not keeping it. Right. And then they're just going to have to do a refi after the fact, you know, so they can get their monthly payment down. But again, that's having to be flexible in order to be strong, you know, stronger than your competition to be successful. And is it a headache? Yes. You know, so you just have to balance that. Like, is that headache worth it to you as the buyer? But right now it's rough. <laughs> so for somebody who's a seller like that, there, there's a few options you can consider. So let's say you're going to sell your place, mm -hmm. um, but you didn't want to make that new purchase contingent. That's kind of what you were just describing. Yep. And you had enough money in the bank to just put the minimum down or, or you know, a decent down payment on a new purchase, sell the other one afterwards, right? Just worry right. about that later so you can get your offer accepted. So on that new loan, you could, you could have a couple options. You could do a bridge loan where you could actually cover money from the equity on your existing home, kind of cross over, bridge it to the new loan. Yeah. Those loans are typically a little bit more expensive, a uh, little bit less desirable in overall rate and term, and it can be a little bit slow right now. So that, but that's one option. Mm -hmm. Another is to basically uh, do, as you said, and, and put the money down, sell this place, and then just do a refinance. A third option would be to do a combination loan where you do uh, a first mortgage and then you have a small second mortgage, which is similar to the amount of money you're going to make off the sale of your other house, your departing residence. Whenever you sell that one, you could wipe out that second. Then you're left with that smaller first mortgage. You didn't have to refinance to do that. You just kind of have that one there. And if you do that, sometimes that's nice because now you got that equity line of credit that you could not pay any interest on if you paid it off yeah. and you can keep it open. So if you decided that once you moved in, like, wow, we hate our bathroom mm -hmm. and you blew all your money, you know, when you sold your house and paid off this loan and all that stuff, you could go back to that equity line and pull it. It's almost like a, a credit card tied to your, your home's equity. So you can pull from that a little bit and you only pay interest on the money that you borrowed. So that could be another option. And then lastly would be a recast. Now you have to check with the bank, see if they offer this, but recasts are really cool. So here's how recasts work. Let's say that you're in your new, your new house, you've made three payments on it and you got like 200 grand equity from the sale of your other house. And so you want to throw that chunk on this new one. You could basically bring that 200 grand in and they'll recast the loan. In other words, they'll re-amortize that loan over the remaining term with that big influx of money over that new balance. So now your principal and interest over the next 20, you know, uh, 27 yeah. years, let's say, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, 357 months would, would be shrunk down. So you'd have a payment that reflects having that big down payment anyways. I mean, it's kind of like, kind of like a modification, but not in a bad way. And yeah. it, it doesn't require a full refinance, you know, full escrow title fees, et cetera. It's a little bit more of a streamlined process that way. So, yeah. Uh, so sellers have a lot of options there. Sometimes they don't realize they do. They just kind of think I got to sell this because that's where my money is. Well, if you have just enough maybe to make it happen, talk to your real estate person about what, what else can I do? What, what options and what would that look like? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, so that kind of triggered a thought. I was speaking with somebody this morning 
And this is, you know, unfortunately, probably an all too common situation um, where a family member co-signs on a house for somebody and they want to sell, but both parties are on title and it takes both parties to agree to sell. Yeah. Um, and they're, you know, she was telling me like, hey, well, I'm asking them, you know, it's been like six months. I've been trying to get them to refinance the house so I can get that, you know, for just the loan in their name. And then, and she would quit claim her ownership to them, right? Um, but she can't, like, or they're not completing the refi for whatever reason. And now she's kind of held hostage on this other house and, you know, can't purchase something else. Yeah, that, that's definitely a challenge. Um, so in that scenario, you know, if somebody was uh, literally a co-signer mm -hmm. and, you know, main party is the one making the payment, but they were, all, you know, so if, if your client would say is the co-signer, mm -hmm. sometimes if there's enough payment history, we can document that the other party is the one making the payment and omit that liability altogether. So that, that could be a solution there. But if they bought it together with the intent to live together, or the loan was done in such a way that it looked like they were buying it completely together. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of on the line for that mortgage. And if they don't qualify for that one with the other one that they're trying to buy, then you have to have some kind of resolution on that. that new How long of a payment process. history do you need? What, what's that? I'm sorry? How long of a payment history uh, showing that the other person was making those payments? Generally 12 months. Okay. Yeah. Now, there could be some exceptions if you're a little bit shorter than that, but usually 12 months is kind of the rule of thumb on that. Okay. Good to know. I will talk to her about that for sure. Yeah. And so you just got to dive in to see like, what did they sign? What did the notes look like when they closed? Are they both on title? Are the payments coming out of, uh, you know, your client's account? And, and, you know, sometimes we'll have a family member deposit money into that person's account and then it comes out and they're like, well, the deposits were from my other family member, but yeah, but it's coming out of your account anyway. So you really can't, you can't have it get around. It looks like you're the one making the payment on it. So um, so there's a few things you got to kind of watch and layer in there, but yeah, there, there's solutions for that. Awesome. All right. Anything else for uh, preparing for extended stay at home orders? Yeah. So I think a good practice, and this is just something uh, personally that I I've always kind of done in, in various times that kind of get a little bit tight or that uh, times of change. I like to kind of write things down. I'll either put them in my phone or I'll write it down, but I'll kind of express like, man, this was painful because X. And then I'll explain exactly what that is. I'm doing it for myself so I have a reference. So I think because a lot of us, well, all of us have been locked down, you know, going back to March, yeah. with a little bit of a restriction on, you know, our, our various ability to, to travel or to do different things. It's nice to actually kind of write down like what, what you would have done different or what you wish you would have known prior to that. So in other words, if you took on maybe a little bit too much debt and you were expecting that you're going to have all these overtime hours to pay that debt, credit yeah. card or what have you, you're like, yeah, I'm not doing that again. Write it all down because you'll go back to real regular everyday life. And then when you get locked down again, you'll find that, oh man, that, there's that pain again. It's here. I never made any kind of change to it. So I think as it relates to, uh, to debt or to, you know, just overall planning, if you don't have debt, save, 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 because mm -hmm. you never know when you're really going to need that and, and put it in a place where you have access to it. So maybe if you're one that doesn't like to have a big savings account, but maybe throw it in a money market account where you can pull it if you needed to, but you can't just go to the ATM and pull money from it. If you've got kind of that bad sticky finger of going to the ATM and pulling all your cash out. Yeah. So if you need to build disciplines in there or build a barrier in there, you can do that. Um, but I also think you got to take a hard look, everybody should, at what your liabilities are today and where that money goes. And it's not just stuff on your credit. It's your Netflix account. It's your um, all your various uh, things that come in and pull from your, your checking or savings account mm -hmm. automatically that you just sort of you don't drill down on your bank account all that often and you forgot, oh, that was $19 here. Not a big deal. Well, that was $10 here. Not a big deal. Well, all of a sudden you got like 150 bucks or $200 in there that would have been really nice to not have to pay. Yeah. Maybe you could have put those things on pause um, just while you're kind of figuring out, you know, what this, this new economy is going to really look like. So I yeah. think it would be really wise to do that, especially knowing that probably going into the, uh, to the winter months, we're probably going to have some serious uh, issues on some of that stuff here. 
for sure. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of people, you know, that had vacations and things planned um, that aren't able to go, they got canceled, right? Um, that extra money that they had spent or budgeted for, you know, they should be saving that, like you said, like just mm -hmm. put that aside and let's see what this all looks like over the next however long. Yeah, some vacation money was actually put on a credit card. Well, then when you get the refund back, mm -hmm. I've seen this before, it doesn't go back on the credit card. It just goes back into your checking account and then you spend it on something else. But you're still paying interest. Correct, exactly. So, you know, pay attention to those things. Those are, those are small, small adjustments that you can make that will uh, bring awareness to where money's actually going and flowing. And it'll also uh, allow you to kind of better prep for, you know, maybe times of, uh, you know, a little uncertainty and, and things that are a little bit uh, you know, tighter, you know, somebody's income, if you, if you do go back to work and now your position maybe is a little different and your pay is a little different. Uh, yeah. You're working, but you're also not making exactly what you were thinking or um, somebody who, you know, works a lot of overtime or weekend hours and they're getting paid that extra differential for that. But maybe those hours are cut short because they, well, we can't have, you're working all this overtime, we're going to cut it back down or you have to furlough every Friday. You know, there's, there's all these, all these businesses are coming up with their own little plan. And so somewhere we're all going to fall into that mix. You just really got to watch uh, what's coming in and what goes back out to make sure that you maximize what you get to keep mm -hmm. and what you get to live off of. Um, and, uh, you know, shameless plug on refinances, but the cheapest place to borrow money is usually your house. Yeah. We're at record lows pulling money out and going, oh man, I don't want to move my, my interest rate, uh, you know, to, to do a cash out refi to get 3.3% or 3.5 if maybe you were on a on pace to do a 15 year loan anyways. Mm -hmm. It could be worth looking at if you're shoring up a lot of other liability or a lot of other debt. Um, yeah. or, or we get the resistance sometimes on, you know, an $800 car payment that has 24 grand left to pay off. And they're like, yeah, I don't want to build that into my mortgage. So I'm going to pay on it for 30 years. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, 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 we're not asking you to pay on it for 30 years. We're going to build it into your mortgage so that it can make things a little more comfortable here. And then you're going to throw chunks at that thing so that you get better. You're going to, in that, in that next, uh, would be 24 months, we're going to get you to a place where you would be in a better position anyways. Let's yeah. model that out. So let's look at what that actually can do for you. Um, there's, there's huge opportunity. We've seen people save a ton of money. Um, and then now they're able to make it where otherwise they would have been a little tight or maybe even running negative on, yeah. on some of their accounts. For sure. And when I remember however many years ago, when I first really started paying attention to that, um, I had to make it a game. Like I had to gamify it. Right. And it was like, okay, one of the games I played was how much money can I cut out of the auto expenses? Right. And like, Oh, look, you know, I, cut out 300 bucks or whatever um but the other game that probably was more helpful was seeing how many days i could go without spending money and make it a game a like, yeah like it's yeah. been 10 days and i haven't spent any money you know outside of normal household bills right but no starbucks or drive like whatever um that one was fun, but that helped a lot because like you said, just like the nickel dime stuff, like even if it's Starbucks every day and you're like, oh, I saved 20 bucks on, you know, coffee this week, or, you know, if I had all kinds of guilty pleasures then, like I would stop at the gas station in the morning and get like a bag of chips and a monster and yeah, it was all bad, but making a game out of it is the point. And I saw a lot of success with that when I did it the first time. So yeah. Yeah, five dollars here, five dollars there. It all starts to stack. And if you're carrying any other debt, you know, that five bucks gone isn't just five dollars gone because if you have a credit card you're paying 20% interest on, yeah, and that five dollars could have gone toward that, even though it's only five dollars. If you do it multiple times throughout the month, yeah, you're paying you're technically paying interest on that money because you didn't use it to pay that other stuff off, right? So you have to really start to kind of evaluate where that money is actually going. Yeah. Somebody I had lunch with yesterday was, you know, talking about the Dave Ramsey, you know, the snowball uh, yeah. method and, you know, that they had done that a couple of years ago and they just, how much that that helped them, you know, they took their smallest monthly payment and they paid that off. But instead of just spending that money elsewhere, they took it and applied it to their next smallest payment and they accelerated it and they just went through. And I think he said that they paid off like 
28 grand over like 18 months of debt. And then that's huge. That's huge. And then at the end of that, it was, I think it was like $1,200 a month or something is what their minimum payments were. So at the end of the 18 months, it was like they got a pay raise of 1200 bucks a month because they didn't have any of this debt and they had all of that cash and they started stacking it or reinvesting it somewhere else. And that was on, I think he said at the time he was making 70,000 a year. And so 1200 a month is a big deal on 70,000. Like, it's like almost 20% of his pay, like monthly. That's, that was huge. Yeah. So I think that people should, you know, to your point, pay attention to budget and trim the fat and and even if it's all for naught, let's say everything lifts in three months and it all goes away and you eliminated your debt and you saved a bunch of money, like that's not hurting anybody. You know what I mean? That's that's a healthy practice sure. for you anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, you come out of COVID a little healthier, you know, with financially. And you know, you could you can make the same uh, analogy to somebody who maybe because of COVID, I can't go to restaurants. And because of restaurants, I can't eat the bad food that I used to eat. So I'm going to eat at home a little bit more often. Now I'm a little bit healthier. So you can come out of this environment in a better place. For sure. Even though the initial picture looks like it's going to be rough or you're, you're sacrificed, you're going without. Uh, but the reality is it might actually be kind of a cool little uh, forced blessing that gets us to take a, a hard look at some of the the habits that we all have that we may or may not need it may or may not serve us right because eating that fast food or that making it less convenient to get or eating in that restaurant maybe that doesn't do our body very good yeah so maybe i'd figure out a solution to cook at home a little bit more um, or you know maybe spending that money on, on those various things that i don't need anymore yeah. could be better you know sent somewhere else and, and make like a nice little savings account for me down the road so yep. yeah I think, I think that in that practice really doesn't take that long. It sounds really like it would take you all day. It takes like an hour, you know, yeah. drilling all the bank accounts now have these cool features that you can kind of figure out like what are, what's my average spending on fast food? What's my average grocery bill? You start to chunk these things down and you can see it really, really quickly without yeah. having to uh, do the old school, print out your bank statements, like line by line, calculate it out. You don't have to do that anymore. It's really easy. Yeah. Well, and to your point with that, like with the fast food, like with all of the food prep businesses that are out there right now, yep. I mean, coming out of it healthier, I think that the food prep um, meals are what, probably like seven, eight bucks a piece, right? Yes, we, we subscribe to a food prep service. Uh, my wife and I eat that during the week. Um, mm -hmm. It's three meals a day, uh, Monday through Friday, and that service is on par with like a small meal if you if you were to go it's actually cheaper than going out to eat it's like i think you're to your point it's right around like seven and some change per meal yeah um, but if i was to go get a number one yeah. like a number one in and out is freaking nine bucks with <laughs> it's crazy i used to pay six dollars for that thing now i'm yeah. old so it's nine dollars so um but yeah it's it's definitely cheaper and it's better for you a hundred percent so yeah darn we don't get the entertainment or luxury of going out right but we can be way healthier for it yep. and and it's honestly that's way easier than you know the people that go drive through for lunch every day or whatever because the amount of time that's wasted for that like even like from my office like if i were to go from here what's the closest fast food carl's jr is in the parking lot or arby's yeah. that's easily going to take 20 30 minutes of my time to get up leave go sit in the drive through come back and then eat probably 30 minutes of my time. Yeah. And so like I brought in a microwave here and I was bringing my lunch to the office and that took like three minutes to prep, however long it takes to microwave, right? And the 10 minutes to eat. So I saved time. It was way healthier. I felt better. And, you know, it, you just regained the time in the day too. So. Well, the line to your point, like 30 minutes ago, it's in your parking lot. It's not going to take you 30 minutes. Oh. Yeah. Well, those lines are, crazy long because nobody's in the restaurant so have you seen chick-fil-a recently like i drove by the chick-fil-a chick-fil-a is donnie you look at that and you're like no there's 60 <laughs> cars in line i'm not waiting in that line you actually move through there pretty quick i've done the line it they got magic they move everybody through really fast they're taking my order like on the on palmdale boulevard basically or, or, yeah. or rancho vista boulevard right and they're like taking my order there i'm like 
I'm 40 cars away from getting my food. Why are you taking my order right now? Mm. Somehow that works. It goes through. So I give Chick-fil-A a lot of credit for that. But yeah, um, those lines are insane. Uh, yeah. In and out, another one. Crazy lines on some of that. And then you got some of them that are just slow. And you're like, how? You have five cars in line. It's going to take me 40 minutes to get through this. Why? I don't understand. Yeah. So, yeah. Crazy. All right. Well, anything else for prepping for extended stay at home? Oh, I, I think that's it. I think if anybody ever needed any help, I mean, I, I, I live, eat and breathe, you know, the debt management part of life and kind of that planning aspect. I love all that stuff. So i um, kind of a student of the, the Ramsey school of thought on a lot of, a lot of issues. I'm uh, happy to share a lot of that with, you know, whoever wants to, to kind of learn that. So, um, you know, that part's fun and it, it's fun. You know, like you mentioned, you had somebody that, uh, had, had taken that debt snowball approach and, and freed that up. So it's really cool to talk to somebody in the beginning of that and then to also follow up with them when they've completed that yeah. and just hear how that was. And it's like, it's painful at the beginning. It's not fun. Yeah. But at the very end, they're like, oh my gosh, this is life changing for us. And through that process, we've realized we can say no to certain things or we need certain things and some stuff we don't. And they, they really kind of create like a new rule that they live their life by. It's really fun to watch. It is. It's good. And it prepares for the hard times, right? It prepares you. So a lot, not that they're all immune from it, but a lot of the folks that do subscribe to that kind of school of thought yeah. can weather these nasty storms a lot easier than the ones that are kind of paycheck to paycheck. And look, we've all kind of been there before. Paycheck to paycheck's real. It happens. Yeah. You can pull out of it. You, you, you can't pull out of it without making any changes. You have to make some changes. So we have to figure out easy baby steps to get you to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, right? So you can eventually get completely out of that. Yeah, out of the rat race. Out of the rat race. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right, sir. Well, thank you. And I will be talking to you soon. And we will see everybody again uh, next week. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care.